Okay, this interview is being conducted on uh, July 20th in the year 2016 here at the Niles Public Library. My name is Neil O'Shea and I'm speaking with Ira Graham. Mr. Graham was born on September the 5th, 1926, 1926 in Chicago. Uh, and uh, Mr. Graham learned of the Veterans History Project through contact with uh, a veteran whom we had interviewed previously here, uh, Irv Abramson. So Mr. Graham has kindly consented to be interviewed for this project, and here is his story. Um, so, uh, Ira, can I ask you, when did you enter the, uh, the service? Uh, August uh, 2000, I'm pardon, uh, uh, August 1944. Uh, and where were you living in Chicago at that time? 64th in California, 6415 South California in Chicago. Yeah. And had you completed high school at that time? At Lindblom High School. You graduated from Lindblom High School. Yes. Yeah. When you were at Lindblom, did they have uh, an ROTC program? Yes, I was in the ROTC. Ah. I, and my goal was to at least get out of it as a commission officer. I think I was a, I think I was a first lieutenant. So you probably started high school around the time the war was beginning, or shortly before. The uh, if you graduated, yeah, it was uh, uh, that was the war started in thirty nine. So I was what thirteen years old, and so um, I remember going to a uh, bazaar at, at the temple that I belonged to, my parents, and uh, it was on a Sunday happened to be December 7th, and we heard that Pearl Harbor had been attacked, and the people of my father's age said, I'll give those Japanese a week, it'll be over, you know, they, you know who do they think they are, and it wasn't over in a week, it's, yeah. but, so. Do you think the fact that war was in the offing affected your decision to participate in the, in the ROTC or the... Well, uh, first of all, I was in Boy Scouts, uh -huh. and um, I, uh, my, I joined a troop, and it folded uh, in uh, six months or something like that. But before that, uh, my parents, on uh, one Sunday morning, the uh, bell rang, and uh, somebody was at the door, and it turned out to be a salesman for a, a summer camp, and I, I hadn't heard that they were planning to do that and when I and this guy started to show me pictures of the camp and all that stuff I just felt I was being sold down the river so I just got up and, and ran to the back of the house and locked the bathroom door and I said through the locked door when I'm 12 years old I'll, I'll go to scout camp it seemed to be long enough in advance so but when I was 12 I joined the, the troop that just lasted six months but I was interested enough in scouting that I went on a provisional basis uh, for individuals that didn't have a troop. And so uh, we did that and uh, I got my Eagle Scout in, in scouting. And in those days, did they do an Eagle Scout project? Yeah, we did a project. I can't really remember what the project was. I think it was a park or something like that. But, but uh, I, I... So did you graduate from Lindblom then in the May or June of 1944? Yes, sir. And you fully expected to be, to be drafted? Or? Yes, but this friend of mine, Alan Milak, had, uh, I was really not sure whether he was a semester ahead of me or a year. He was somewhat ahead, and he qualified for a military program, Army A-12. There was an equivalent to the Navy. I took the test, but uh, whether the war was winding down or I didn't get as good a score as he did. He, he got into the program and I did not. So uh, so I thought so he was in the program and he was, stay, uh, he was sent to Hunter College in New York City and he wrote me, we communicated a lot, but he wrote me and said, please join the Navy before you're drafted. He really made it a strong, advice. Whether he didn't like the army or whether, I don't know what motivated him to do that, but he saved my life in a sense because 
he went in and they washed out the whole program as described in the DVD, Patton, as a companion disc that showed how the movie was made in addition to the movie itself. And uh, they mentioned in that that the educational programs of early commissioning was the, the, uh, discontinued by Patton's request that he needed troops for that final version of the uh, so, so then you, um, you enlisted in the Navy then? Yes. As a result of this, what proved to be yeah. wonderful advice from, from my life. Um, I had asthma as a younger child that was not active by this time, but I didn't tell the Navy about that. I really wanted to get in, and I didn't want to be a 4F or anything like that. So you're, you shared that, uh, that wish on the part of so many men of your generation, you wanted to get, get in and contribute to the effort. Yeah, yeah, I was just a natural thing. I mean, that's that's what you know. I and your parents who accepted that and oh uh, yeah, they were, they were proud and everything. Were you an only child or no? I had a brother four years younger, so he was spared that probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you were uh, you were inducted and you went through Great Lakes. Great Lakes. And then I, um, I can't explain to you how uh, the, the Navy worked, but so it was fantastic. When it, at Great Lakes, they gave us a one-on-one -on -one interview. Pre, prior to that, they showed us the movies of all the duties of, of Navy people, and uh, so we knew what they were sections were and what the occupations were and this one-on-one -on -one interview would be equivalent to being interviewed for Habit Labs or something like that. I mean it was uh, what, what they wanted to know what I wanted to do when I got out of the Navy and I said I was interested in going to college and being a chemist or a chemical engineer and they said the thing that we would think about would be like a lab tech or something like that. So I said, okay, and they said, your grades were good in math, and we put down a second choice, how about quartermaster, it would be on the bridge of a ship with navigation and things like that. So it sounded like a pretty good deal. So in the boot camp, you start talking to your fellow, uh, you know, uh, Navy guys, and when I told them what my first choice was, they said, you could, might be a good choice, but it's not. You're not going to be a lab tech. You're going to be in the core, bringing blood to the invasion. And so, I I wanted to be in service, but I'm not sure I was that strong of a person motivated to carrying blood on an invasion because Iwo Jima and Okinawa were there. So they said we'll give you a second choice. My my chief was was a hard-ass guy. I mean, he was really by the book, but when I told him I wanted to change the classification, he, he told me how to get to the other side of Great Lakes to where I could do that. And I followed his directions, went over there, they pulled out the punch card and it was, I would just give you a second choice if you prefer to do that. And that's how I got to be a quartermaster in the Navy. A quartermaster is not a storekeeper, it's on the bridge of the ship. But so this, um but you didn't have any difficulties adjusting to life to life in the no, was, military? No. And I could swim, you I, I had to jump off a tower uh, in case he... Yeah. I suppose that, that the Boy Scout in the ROTC yeah. training, it sort of gets used to that. You right. accept that there's authority and... In, know, in service school, I, you know, after I finished Great Lakes, I mean after I finished boot camp, uh, I, I, as I said, I qualified for the service school, and uh, a short time in, the, in the, that program, I came down like many other people at the Great Lakes at the time uh, with scarlet fever. There was an epidemic, and so I was uh, pulled out of that company that I was in for the treatment. I don't know if it was a week or ten days, and the doctor in charge of the program uh, was. Uh, on the idea of uh, vitamin C as a recovery thing. So we they brought in grapefruit and oranges and 
we could eat all, all those that we wanted. And I got over it without any heart damage or anything like that. Well, so far it sounds like the Navy's taking care of you. Yeah, it's, yeah. Did you have to? Did you receive advanced training beyond the service school? Service was, school. Yeah. That was also at Great Lakes. Yeah, yeah. So um, from Great Lakes, then you assigned to a ship that you pick up on the okay. West Coast? Or? Yeah, yeah. My, my, in, in preparation for this, I was just thinking about this thing. My, my story is like in three parts. They're not necessarily equal parts. But one third was at Great Lakes, boot camp and service school. Second uh, 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 third of the thing was being transported from Great Lakes to San Francisco on a troop ship and a problem of finding my ship. They, I was not at Samar where we landed, although we went, we stopped at Pearl Harbor and we heard there was a VE day and then uh, Samar wasn't there, it was transferred to Leyte on another ship and then from Leyte through the Admiralty Islands and to uh, Hollandia, New Guinea. I will, it's, each of these things were smaller ships that I was being transported. And when I got to Hollandia, I saw the ship that I recognized, I, I'd seen pictures of it, and it was called the U.S. APC, USS APC. Uh, a is aust, uh, auxiliary, P is transport, or personnel, and T is transport, uh, or C was, I guess, the equivalent of that, APC for. Uh, it was leaving Hollandia, so I got off the ship with a few other people that were on it and worked my way to the port office, told them that I think I saw my ship, you know, but where is it now? And they checked it and they said, it's on its way to the Philippines. So uh, I, I really pleaded with them to get me to the, my ship. I wanted to get a rating, I wanted to do what I was trained to do, and I think for a kid that was just a little over 18 years old, um, I think they thought I was ambitious to do that, and so they got me on a DC-3. I was the only passenger. It was like building materials. We island jumped to the to Manila, and and eventually to Subic Bay, where my ship was. Did any of your um, any of the any of your friends in the Navy that you met at Great Lakes? Did they? Did they go west with you, but then everybody went to different ships? Or? Different ships. Yeah. And then what was the hardest part of quartermaster training? Was that? You know? no, it's very academic type. I mean, it's, uh, you, you kept a log of the ship every day, uh, weather conditions and, and things. Uh, you, uh, the ship was, did not move very much, so we were uh, in, in, in Great Lakes, I mean, in uh, Subic Bay, uh, rarely got off the ship, although it was tied up. Um, I know one occasion we walked into the town and got uh, some ice cream and brought some of it back. Subic Bay, that was a huge base, right? Yes, yeah. Right. So you, you took the train from Chicago to San Francisco? Right. And you try to catch on to the right ship. So always have, we always have to ask, like, how, how, how do you get seasick on the sailing? Or? No, I... My experience was as long as I had something to do, I wouldn't get seasick. If it was just sitting or standing, uh, being a, a passenger or something like that, I, my stomach would, I, I never vomited or anything. And the food wasn't so bad on the ship? No, it was, no. Uh, on, on my little ship, it was, it was, the ship was only like 120 feet long, well, made of wood, and it was made in Maine. But uh, it's an unusual wow. ship, as you can see. Yeah. And um, so... Uh, this I, is the, the ship here, you yeah. and this is the ship yeah. that you journeyed in from San Francisco? No, no, not. This no, is it was a huge the, army. Oh, transfer. this is around the Philippines. Yeah, in the yeah. Philippines. Yeah. But I... Um, now, I have to ask you this. Were you, sub were you subjected to any um, rites of passage, as it were, when you went over the equator yeah, or anything? Yeah, we got, I got that in my office. Uh, the, uh, the, the uh, frame, it's framed as a crossing the equator and then um, 
the dateline. I have one for the that, and I saved all those things in print. But it wasn't too uh, unpleasant, or no, it was kind of a joke. But too, it, wasn't, not, yeah. it wasn't hazing gone wild no, or anything. No. Yeah, yeah, shellbacks or something. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, one is just. I think that's the equator. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, was it difficult to stay in touch with your family when you were in the Pacific? No, there was the forerunner of email that was called V-Mail, and I uh, communicated with them, and um, I took the liberty of uh, doing some sketches on the thing so I could tell them something that might not ordinarily be trans transmitted that went through the V-Mail. Um, so, uh, I, I was able to, to do that, and uh, there was one experience, uh, several years before I went into the service, we were we lived on the south side and uh, some other branch of the family were north, we were kind of like the south side people, they're not, the north side was a little higher class, they thought, they thought, I think, and uh, it was good, we were driving down a main street in Chicago on an icy winter and uh, it was very slippery and my dad had trouble avoiding an accident but uh, he strained to avoid it and uh, got some sort of a swelling in his neck and um, the doctor didn't think it was any problem or anything like that but it, it apparently got worse and so when I was in the Philippines in communicating they wrote me and they said your father is and I have surgery now, and we're talking to a congressman to get you home for the surgery. And I was very uh, annoyed that they would do that. I didn't want I didn't want to come back until I was finished regularly. So I did. I don't know if this would have been a question. Did you have a, a preference if you did your naval service in the Atlantic or the Pacific? I mean, I know I, the I wasn't given the choice. You wasn't given the choice. Yeah. Um, so. At this time, I'm thinking back when, when, the, when the, some gentleman said it will be short, well, the Japanese will be taken care of in a short yeah. time. But when you were going to the Philippines and you're out there in Subic Bay, you really felt the war was coming to, to an end and the United States was going well, to be was, victorious? Well, yeah, uh, as I said, when we landed in Pearl Harbor on the way over, we heard there was VE Day. So, yeah. you know, it was like gradually happening. But, uh, you know, we got word of an atomic bomb being dropped in Japan when I was in New Guinea. So you, were, you got the news of the bomb when you were in New Guinea, which yeah. is where you went from the Philippines. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it, everything seemed like it was being wrapped up, but you, know, you really didn't, you know, the, there was no television or anything like that. Yeah. So, um, so at this stage of the war, did you feel pressure or stress or anything? Or? No, my stress was I was on this ship and they had a quartermaster on it and the ship only would have one quartermaster. So I wanted to get on, be, be, become a quartermaster of that ship. And so when a bigger ship came into port, I would, quartermaster is a joint rate with signalmen. They, they work together. So I would signal with the flashing light. Uh, uh, do you need a quartermaster? No one needed them. So, I mean, that was pressure to try to get my rating. And yeah. Then, when you say a rating, is that a promotion or that just... Yeah, you like I was like equivalent to a private when mm -hmm. I got out of, uh, I mean, the army equivalent of the, the seaman, it was called, in the Navy. But you did s but, uh, rise to quartermaster yeah, third class? Yeah, because my, my friend, no, third class. Third when, class? When my... When my quartermaster got out of the service because of points, you know, there was a point system of, he, 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 he got out and I was left on the ship and got, he got my rating. And do you, do you recall the name of the ship on which you got your, your rating? Yeah, well, this is, that was USSS APC-4. But this isn't the APC-4. That's it. That's, that's it, it there. Okay. Yeah. So you, did you learn Morse code or signaling? Yeah, that would were, be part of it. Yeah. So did uh, did you, in terms of relaxation or entertainment, did were there any USO shows or did you get any 
interesting leaves in Manila, getting the ice cream, was that it? I mean, Wait, that was one of the things, I don't, I don't, uh, I know that on one of the ships that we, I was on going uh, south to try to find my ship, uh, they had movies on the uh, deck of the ship and we saw a movie, I think it was called The Picture of Dorian Gray and something like that. And, mm -hmm. And um, there's another one that uh, was a great movie, I'm trying to think of it, but uh, Laura, I think, was the name of the movie. So uh, we had that, and a good a friend of mine on the ship was a radio man, and he would pipe in uh, USO broadcasts and music and stuff like that. And I, I know I listened to uh, one record that he had over there, Moonlight in Vermont, it's still a favorite of mine. Moonlight in Vermont. The, um, did you pick up any interesting habits in the, na in the Navy, like smoking or drinking beer? I didn't beer? smoke. I, um, the first uh, beer I ever had was uh, on my ship, uh, the officer in charge, I don't think it was the captain, but uh, probably another officer took us out in a launch or something like that and they had beer. And that was my first beer, and um, you know, I did. Uh, I know that some guys find found women, and uh, I, I, I was young, and I my values were not aligned with that. So, um, with the timing of the war and then the location, um, you never felt you were. Uh, the ship, did, was it ever, did you ever sense that you were in danger or in peril well, from planes or mines ship, or had, something? We had a, a, you know, a call to, like an alarm that we, maybe they heard a, a signal that might have been a submarine or could have been a fish or something. And we went to battle stations, but it was no action on the thing. Could, was your ship, had it did have a front gun or on it? Or? It had a gun, but I mean, were you trained in shooting that gun? No, no. no. So well, you would have had a, you might have had a hard time defending yourself then if you can. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, we're in a port most of the time, so. So what is, what is the, the sailing purpose of, of an AP Okay, team? all right. Well, that's an interesting thing. I mean, this is, you know, by, it's wooden and it's uh, small. Uh, in, in the, when it got to, Australia or Hollandia and New Guinea, uh, its function was to be a f um, command ship or a, uh, be the center of a LCT, that's landing craft. Uh, uh, so these landing crafts would uh, unload ships from bigger ships and then bring the material to the shore and uh, this was a flagship for that fleet. And um, so then when MacArthur uh, reached the point where uh, the war was moving to the Philippines, that's where ships like the APC-4 uh, were so, transferred. So for how, many, for how many months or period of time were you in Subic Bay? Well, I, you know, I was saying that that's about a, a third of the time. It would probably be uh, seven or eight months. And then seven or eight months in Hollandia, New Guinea? No, it was, New Guinea was only until I could get arrangements to get transportation to the Philippines. So, I mean, I... Oh, it's icy. So it was New Guinea was the stepping point to, to Subic Bay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And when you went from, from Hollandia, from New Guinea to Subic Bay, was you made that journey on another ship. No, that was a, f a flight, as I said before. That was it the was DC-3, yeah, now right. I get it, thank you. They were like uh, reinforced rods for mm -hmm. concrete and stuff. Yeah. What would reinforced rods for concrete? Well, you know, it was like these metal uh, round reinforced rods and when they built something. Like rebars or whatever, yeah. yeah it would reinforce uh, and they put concrete put that inside concrete to give the strength of the thing. Any, you know, any construction would have rods in, 
in, in, embedded in the concrete. Yeah, but that didn't have anything to do with the DC-3. No, no. It was, they, they were just carrying this material to... They were carrying the rebars. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Incidentally, the captain on the ship, there were two incidents that were in the thing. One was our refrigerator was uh, overused because of the heat. And so there was a sign on the refrigerator saying that only people allowed into the refrigerator would be the uh, cook or someone working on the refrigerator. So um, I was on duty uh, at 2 o'clock in the morning or something, and somebody went into the refrigerator to see if there was any ice because the drinking fountain, the scuttlebutt, was not working as well. So I put my finger in there to see if the ice had been frozen. Just as we did that, the, the door to the wardroom for the officers down the galley, they would go down the, uh, what do you call it, it's like a hall, the um, passageway uh, slammed. So it sounded like somebody was coming down the thing there. And he looked at me, I was on duty, and he said, Graham, did you open the refrigerator? And I said, no, but I put my finger in it. That's one of the, you know, some of the Navy expressions, like don't sh don't shoot till you see the whites of their eyes or something. I can be damn the poor torpedoes. So he said, I think you better see the captain. So it was like, it sounded like a bean on report. I, report. I went up to him before I was asked to go up there and told him about it and he could hardly keep from laughing. It, you know, I was so worried about the thing. The other time was we were backing into a uh, slip at the pier, at the pier, and um, when backing down, I don't know if I was at the wheel or not at the time, but I can't remember that. But the ship got tangled; the, the screw of the you know, the propeller got wrapped around. Uh, uh, I mean, a rope hauser, it was called, and it got tangled there. So the captain told the bosun mate to get into the water and cut that rope because they had tried to reverse the screw and stuff. He went over and uh, he was a husky guy and all that and he couldn't do it. So the captain got undressed and jumped in and uh, did it. Now the captain was from Greenwich, Connecticut. His wife was a, f a knife model and when he got undressed there was silk underwear. Everybody we were, chuckled? Well, we were, you know, just could not believe it, but he cut the rope and... and do you remember his name? Yes, I do. It's, that goes with it. It's called, uh, i got to think of it now, Royal E. Peterson the II. The and I looked it up in the Google, and uh, apparently he's still alive. Uh, it was at the time, but his wife had died. And uh, I thought of communicating with him, and I still might do it, but... Yeah, but he knew he knew how to handle himself in naval yeah, situations. Yeah, yeah. He was a terrific guy. I mean, they, it was an interesting ship. And so you would have um, it was, you have good things to say about the Navy as an institution, based on your experiences at the Great Lakes, and then this was a good yeah, officer that you had. Yeah. Ever, I was thinking of staying in the Navy or ah, it. that's a question. Yeah, yeah. So I, you did, you did consider making a career of the Navy? Yeah, I had nothing. I mean, I had. It sounded like a great deal for me, but I was somewhat concerned about, and that continued through my life, of, uh, you, you know, uh, I kind of wanted to be more on my own, and I didn't want to be someone's decision to mm -hmm. tell me where to go and stuff like that. So that was a discouragement of the thing. So, the, um, so you spend um, the seven months at, uh, at Subic Bay, so the... Your ship isn't planning on sailing to Japan for the no. invasion, anything like that. No, no, no. But, no, but uh, when the war ended, uh, I was in in uh, Hollandia, New Guinea at that time, I think, and it was you know winding down. Uh, eventually, the orders of the ship were to decommission it, and we had to get the ship ready for decommissioning, which included going into a dry dock in, uh, in Subic Bay, 
and um, you know where they you'd float into the dry dock and then they sink it in a sense and uh, there's work on that and then uh, we gave it to the Philippine Navy and they uh, there were two there were one thing that I would have liked to take but I was concerned about the, the illegal aspect was that I, I have an affinity towards clocks so there was a wall clock stainless steel and I uh, you know, it had my my eye on it, but I I didn't take it. But on the decommissioning process, the people from the shore base came aboard to inspect the ship before they turned it over to the Philippines. They opened up a drawer, and the clock was in there, and a forty-five uh, pistol. I didn't ever have the pistol or anything, but and I. I was just amazed. I said, they, they had no idea of that clock being there. I'm sorry I didn't rise to the occasion, but I yeah. didn't take either of them. Yeah. So the fact that you had uh, enlisted, did that affect your the length of time you had to spend in the service? Well, it, it was under a different thing. It was like, uh, I think you're in it I, for, until decided, uh, you know, there was no time limit to be a, at that thing, but when the war ended, there was a a point system, and you, you added points for how long you were in, etc. And I don't know if degree of it or anything like that. But my when the, when the first effect of the point system was that the quartermaster on my ship got got discharged, and so I rose, and then I, it was time for me to get to to be discharged. But, and then from Subic Bay, then you take a ship back to right. San Francisco, or I it, remember that name. Howes, the uh, is an army ship, the uh, troop ship named the Howes. So morale must have been pretty good then, I would imagine. The what? The morale must have oh, been yeah, good. Was, yeah. No casualties with an invasion no. of Japan, or a, no. You weren't needed for the uh, occupation presence or support. No. no. I'm, I, I did my time, I'm happy I was in the service, but I'm no hero, I didn't have any real brushes with any problems. Oh, I think everybody that served was a hero. You all, yeah. they all the, what did they say? You, when, in those days you gave the government a blank check and they could cash it with, for right. whatever, what, much right. of her, whenever they needed it. Um, so you come back to Great Lakes and then you don't have to do any kind of there's no extension or reconsideration, no, it's just... but I did, my feeling was so good about the Navy that I did join the Reserve. And um, it, it was the, uh, I, I chose an active Reserve, so it was like on a monthly or weekly, I can't remember the frequency of meetings that I would go to. And um, I was in college by this time, and uh, I, decided to, uh, uh, with a degree in engineering, that I, I could enlist, uh, I could uh, apply that to uh, a commission in the Navy. And um, so I applied for that, and they um, gave me a physical. And they found that I had a pylonidal cyst. It's like a, you're born with it, and it's, it's, a, it's a cyst that is uh, near your backside. And um, I, I had that when I went in the first time, but I mean, they never noticed it or didn't care about it. But for a commission, they did. And so uh, I um, got a surgeon to remove it, and then uh, discovered that uh, Two things I would have been drafted probably, or at least, or my activated, if I was in the active reserve by that. But a mistake had been made, and when they changed changed me in the process, I decided because of school and things to to go into inactive reserve. And somebody by mistake discharged me from the reserve completely. So I I had repaired myself so I could be eligible for the draft without without no, but. I didn't get drafted, or but I was not in the reserve anymore either. So you would have been eligible for the Korean War draft, is yeah, that what you're saying? Possibly. Yeah, it was actually uh, before the Korean War. There was a, a 
heated situation with Truman getting uh, uh, involved with the Greek. There was something going on in the Greek mm -hmm. thing, and so uh, that was a concern about being activated in that. We had one veteran who was um, in ROTC and um, served in the Navy, and then he had a nice job going, and then he got the draft board call and says, come in. He says, hey, I, I already served in the Navy. Yeah, yeah, but he said, General Hershey says this next war is going to be a land war in Korea. And his, he appealed, but the draft board voted like three to two or two to one, so he had to go in again. Yeah, I didn't have that. But you I might have. I had some concern about that. Yeah, yeah. Just going back to high school, I was in the ROTC, and the principal of Lindblom High School was a very distinguished uh, principal. And through some Chicago politics, he was transferred to Harper, which was a smaller school than Lindblom. And, and the Harper one came over to Lindblom. And the students decided to strike over that. And so they called out the ROTC as... <laughs> Forerunner. <laughs> so I was, yeah. you know, uh, mobilized to, to yeah. school. So, um, so you didn't have any difficulty readjusting to civilian life after the, your right. time, first time in the Navy. And then did you, um, did you seek employment then or did you use the GI Bill to... I got the GI Bill to go to Illinois Tech. IIT? Yeah. I started as a, fire, uh, as a chemist, chemi chemical engineering and... Um, with all the influx of uh, the war and, and men interested in technical things, I was concerned that uh, maybe uh, it would be difficult to get a job. And so uh, there was a program at IIT uh, called Fire Protection and Safety Engineering. And the, um, uh, most of the students in that program were supported by uh, insurance companies that uh, wanted that market. And so I tried to get the scholarship with them, but they said, you've got a GI Bill and you're not eligible. So, but I did go into that program after uh, one year at, at IIT and I graduated with BS in fire protection and safety. And I got a job with an insurance company as a safety engineer. So I did that for one year and then in the process of uh, talking to an insurance salesman, I decided that might that, that I might be better doing that than as an engineer. So I came into the insurance business. And the GI Bill, uh, the GI Bill supported me while I was in there at IIT. Yeah. So did you um, did you stay in contact with any of your wartime buddies after the service, or? Uh, not uh, anyway. One, one is probably the most unusual one. I was driving through the area through Chicago and came to my house with unexpectedly. He was not very well bathed on the ship or when he showed up either. But that was surprising that he was the the only one that came by. But at a uh, on a trip on the Eden's Expressway, uh, paying the toll, I noticed the car alongside me. I recognized them as being in the service school that I was in. And um, I honked and uh, he pulled over when he got through this gate. And uh, he was a, a eye surgeon in training. And uh, we agreed to get together and he became a client of mine. And, um, and a good friend, and uh, he died about a year ago. So were you an independent insurance agent? Or did you I'm an agent of Northwestern Mutual, Northwestern and uh, Mutual. just celebrated my 65th year with, with the company. So I've been that way since, since I start, you know, graduated from college and one year out. Did you um, join a veterans organization or anything? No. no. And so there weren't any uh, reunions then, or necessarily. No, I, I, a book was featured in um, the uh, uh, the uh, New York Times book section, 
a couple of years ago. And uh, uh, this, this company, uh, the publisher of that company, it's probably a, a form of, uh, uh, I can't think of the word now, uh, you know, that you publish it yourself. Vanity? Or Vanity Press. Yeah. Right, exactly. And uh, it was called The Skipper. And it was in this short paragraph about it, it was a naval officer that was trained at Northwestern's ROTC, Naval ROTC, and got on a small ship in the Pacific. So uh, I bought the book. I mean, I ordered it from from uh, Barnes and Noble, but they said it's it's BOD or something, or printed. P.O.B. Printed on demand. P.O.B. Printed would, on demand, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. Just in time, yeah. And so uh, I bought it, and a fantastic story. And um, so I wanted to get in touch with the the, the author, was mm -hmm, this guy that did it. And so the publishing said, well, we, what we do is take your name, and if he wants to communicate with you, he will, which he did by electronic, means he didn't call me up. And um, so he said, the, the uh, flotilla, uh, LCT flotilla, that similar to the one that you were on, is having its reunion at Great Lakes, uh, like next week or something like that. You might want to go. So I, I did go to it. They were all my age, and they were on different kinds of ships, but they was all connected to LCTs. So I, I went to it, but I, I didn't stay in there. When, when was that? I don't know. Uh, <coughs> Probably twenty years ago. Twenty years ago. So I, I sense we're coming to the end of the interview, uh, and uh, there's a couple of questions again that the Library of Congress recommends. Um, so, Ira, how do you think your service uh, and your experiences in the service affected your life? Well, I don't know how I would feel if I didn't serve. I'm, I'm very indebted to the opportunity and I, mean, I kind of choke up even to say it and, and I just uh, my life has just been uh, affected by being the pride of doing it and um, the embarrassment if I didn't if uh, any of those things my father's surgery or my um, asthma as a child if, uh, if I had used any of those things to stay out I'd I would be very embarrassed. Do you think your has your military experience has it influenced your thinking about war or about the military in general? Uh, no, I mean it's this love of the navy is uh, you know is very deep, and um, the uh, there are two books out. One's called the Admirals, and one's called the Generals, and I read both of them and. The admirals came out as being fantastic characters, and and that and the generals were one uh, problem after another. Just not very few. Real Was there stars. a particular Navy admiral that you admired in well, World uh, War Two? Or Clifford uh, Nimitz is one yeah. as being a, he 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 had a collision early in his career, which would have probably kept him from getting to be a flag officer, but he rose above that. A Bull Halsey, a fantastic character, recently written up in another book about being like a loose cannon. And um, he had a rivalry with uh, MacArthur, and, and, and they had a rendezvous set somewhere in the, in the uh, Philippine area, and the weather got very bad, and Bull, Bull uh, Halsey uh, was concerned that if he canceled the rendezvous, MacArthur would think he was yellow. So he proceeded there, and it was a terrible uh, loss of ships. Um, another book I, I read about the war, that I, I can't find this quote, but I definitely read it. That was Halsey had his uh, carriers out. Uh, in December, and a trial exercise, and they were due back on December seventh. And he said he'd be goddamn to risk his carriers, carriers, because he thought 
there was something going on, and he kept them out, and those carriers survived Pearl Harbor and, and led us to our victory at Midway. So, uh, there's, you know, those two people are probably the, the great ones. I mean, Spruance was a, the admiral for the Seventh Fleet when I, where I was in there. And so I'm very moved by, by the whole experience. Um, you, you touched on it before, um, the episode with the, uh, with the refrigerator. Were there any other humorous events that you, you chuckle about or? Well, uh, someone on the ship moved their bowels on the, in the crew quarters and, uh, I mean, it was, it was not a necessity to do that. And in the cook's quarters? No, in the crew's quarters. Oh, yeah. It, it, it's not politically correct to say this, but I mean, it, it, the one that they thought did it was a black uh, mm -hmm. off, uh, seaman, but nothing came of it or anything like that. It was something like the strawberry thing or something in the cane mutiny or something like that. There was some question about that, but uh, the refrigerator and, and the captain in the silk underwear would probably be the great. Yeah. So is there anything else you would like to add that we have not covered in this interview? No, covered my, uh, you know, I've since continued on with an association at going through uh, the, the uh, uh, salad bar at Whole Foods in Evanston. There was an officer in whites, naval officer, and so I approached him and I said I was in the Navy and I you know, wanted to introduce myself or something. I mean, I didn't. Know. I just wanted to say hello, and he. We had lunch there with what we ate, and I'm in Rotary, as it's been shows, and so I invited him to speak at our Rotary Club. And uh, when he left, what happens is he was commandant of the ROTC at Northwestern and IIT, and. Um, I think Loyola too, and uh, when they get to a point where they're, they're captains in the Navy, but if they aren't going to move up to Admiral as the next step, they put them in a school for a year or something like that. So as they leave after their stint, uh, they would refer me to the new replacement. So I've had a chain of these particular ones. Some have been more friendly than others, but the one that uh, the one that I did meet. Captain Martin uh, became a very close friend of mine, and um, extremely close, and we communicate all the time, and I'm having a birthday party, my kids are throwing a party for my 90th birthday coming up in August, and he's coming back from uh, North Carolina to do it. So, so yeah, so you, you still are a Navy-minded man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's not in the Navy, he's discharged now. But he, he was. And that's how you yeah. met him, because he was, yeah. uh, right, because of associations. So when I was, his, one of his replacements, it kind of skipped a couple, my daughter met a woman at some function in, in Wilmet, or in Winneka, and one thing led to another, and she said, her, my husband is a new commandant at, at uh, IIT in Northwestern and the Art Naval ROTC. So she said, oh, my father is very involved. So one thing led another. I met him and I had lunch with him. He's also coming to my birthday party. And um, one thing led to another and he was he named me as honored guest at uh, an affair that they have once a year called a dining in. It's a dinner and, and um, kind of like a play in a way kind of a mixture of Congress and, and the House of Parliament in a way, but so, yeah, I'm, I believe Navy if, you, if I'm cut. It's just 22 months, you know, I mean, no. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's an impressionable age though for a young, a young person. Yeah. Pardon me? It's an impressionable age for a young yeah, person. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, Um, have you 
Has anyone suggested or spoken to you about making the honor flight, or did you make the honor flight? I did make the honor flight. Actually, Captain Martin uh, suggested that, and that's what I did. And it, it's they it kept on uh, my my assistant uh, Katie. Uh, he would, would, would were making some of the arrangements, and the person I met this woman. It's, I can't remember her name now, but she's in charge of the program. And I always oh, thought Mary Pet, Mary what? Mary yeah. It's an Italian. Song. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. I just just had the feeling that she was a uh, older woman from. Mm -hmm. Well, she was at Irv's. Uh, oh yeah, because she's. Were you there? No, no. I heard about. Yeah, she, she, yeah. She's a knockout. I mean, she's yeah. really beautiful young woman. Yeah. And uh, so I was surprised to see that. But uh, anyway, she Mary. Uh, you know, I mean, in the conversation, uh, the woman said, y y your boss or whatever you call me, your employer, will never get over it and all that. And she's, and my, my Katie said, what, what's so unusual about it? And she says, well, I won't tell you, but uh, it's fantastic. It's something, he'll be very impressed. So we, we, uh, we left. Oh, oh, here I know it's uh, Midway, mm -hmm. and uh, they picked us up, and, and uh, it was very early in the morning. Got there, and uh, some delays, but uh, while we were having donuts and coffee, uh, the imitation of the Andrew sisters was the legacies, yeah, yeah, and um, so we got to uh, Dulles, and they were fire engines with sprinkling water and. For some reason, we, we got off schedule or something. So uh, we saw the monuments and the air and Smithsonian air. Yeah, and all yeah. That. but uh, we did, we didn't have time for uh, dinner in, in 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 a restaurant or the airport. So they served it aboard the plane, and uh, th that mail call, our oh. friend, that, it, you know, it, it's so simulating the thing, just you, you wonder, well, everyone else got one of those envelopes, that I didn't get one, and but everyone got one. But then when we landed, there's the fire engines again, and you go through the gauntlet of everyone shaking your hand, saluting, and and just pandemonium, and, and then the, to top it off with the Scottish bagpipes, that's that's what Mary was trying to say. So it's fantastic. And you made that honor flight in um, recently, or well, three years ago. Three maybe. years ago. Yeah. Did you do it, or no? But I uh, I've Seen been the down picture? there for to to welcome a couple yeah. of vets back. It's yeah. uh, the emotion is um, well. It's yeah. It's an amazing. I, it's an amazing I actually, program. I, I have. I had um, the feeling that, well, very briefly, I was at a, this annual meeting, which I'm going to next uh, the end of this week. And, and one of these meetings, there had a football star, and I think it was at West Point, and he was several times to Afghanistan and, and mm -hmm. Iraq, and he lost his legs, and um, and he spoke ab about. Uh, you know, motivation and things like that. And then there was another guy talking about, he was in the insurance business and he wrote a book that you could get your name on it artificially like that, you helped write it. Uh, and it was about your life plans. And I thought about those two guys, you know, one about motivation, the other one motivation in terms of what had happened to them. And I, I thought it's the unfairness of certain people paying the price that it should be more universal. And I was really thinking of getting active in, in, in passing a universal service thing, getting some action. And um, even had like a name, USA, a Universal Service of America or something like that. Our interviews often come to this point. And uh, I, uh, so I got involved with it uh, to the point of thinking about it and all that. And my wife's nephew, um, his wife, uh, is uh, was in Hillary's uh, 
wing of the White House. She worked for Hillary. And uh, uh, she, she's she been very active in things of this type. And she wrote an article that this McQuist, uh, the general that got kicked out of the army from uh, Bush, I think, for saying something. McChrystal. Yeah. McChrystal. Yeah. And there was, those two people wrote this article. It was a joint article with three or four people, the general and my my wife's daughter-in-law, and um, whatever that relation is. And I, you know, I looked into it. That that was on that, but it had some of the problems with it. And then further investigation. It's it, it's a very complicated thing. Even if it could move ahead, uh, there's what would these people do in the universal service? Uh, it's, uh, costs of, you know, can they, the CCC uh, uh, during the war, I mean, the Depression, um, that's one idea, but there's union problems. So they're going to be building bridges, and uh, would these people be volunteers? It just got so complicated that I kind of haven't followed up on it, but I think in spirit, it's just terribly unfair. And I read something recently that people in the southern part of the United States seem to uh, be in service because of the economics or something like that, and just unfair. So, I'm gonna... but the Navy was certainly uh, fair to you, and you were yeah. fair to the Navy. And yeah. Well, thanks for coming in. And I appreciate. Interviewing I appreciate this opportunity. You're welcome, sir.